Hi everyone and welcome back to the vlog and thank you so so much for tuning in as always. Thanks for taking the time out to come and watch these videos. So I had a lovely request again to do an IV vlog. I was a little bit dubious about this because I've never really done IVs. Um, I am a GP nurse and we don't really see it in GP. And then when I was a student, the final year of student life, actually I never saw an IV as such. I, I, we dealt with a lot of syringe drivers which technically is an IV, but not like the drip stands and things like that that you get on the wards. So uh, I'm going to warn you now, I'm not 100% good with IVs. However, I have gone back through my notes and I have done the research to be able to do the vlog today. And I'm going to put all of the links below for you. Have a look at them because there's some really good links there about IVs, different types of cannulas, um, drip rates, it's those sort of things. So yeah, look at the links below, but I'm going to teach you hopefully some things about IVs today. And something I barely ever, ever do for a vlog is make notes, but I have actually made some notes and examples and I have my laptop just in case because I'm not 100% confident with IVs. So I'm going to teach you what I've learned and what I know already from placements and things like that. And hopefully we'll get there. <laughs> So what is intravenous therapy or IV for short? So basically it's just a means of delivering any type of fluid, nutrition, medication straight into your body through the vein. And why are IVs used? Well, it's a really quick, fast access for those that really, really need it. Like I said, is to give things like fluids so if someone's really dehydrated. It's a quick access just to get them hydrated again before it starts causing other problems. It's also used not just for fluid and water, but things like glucose, salts, electrolytes and blood transfusions as well for those that need it. And IVs are usually sort of used in if someone's had an accident, for example, like a really severe accident. It can be used for procedures or surgery. Someone that's had like a, a real loss of fluid. So if they've got severe diarrhea and vomiting, if they've got severe sweats and they're losing all of that electrolytes and the waters and things like that, then they need to replace those. And also anyone that's had a, a lot of blood loss as well, they'll have that blood transfusion as well. The different types of IV therapy, the standard IV drip stand that everybody thinks about. You might have seen these before, you, you've seen them on telly if you haven't seen them in real life. Next we have a syringe driver which I'm going to put photos here um, and this is like I said normally given to palliative care or end of life patients and this is just to help them make them feel more comfortable. So it'll be a syringe inserted into a machine that slowly inserts that medication bit by bit over so many hours and it'll be set up to do that and normally this is morphine, there's anti-sickness, in there. Sometimes that there might be something to help settle anxieties in patients because some patients get really an anxious and anxiety and a little bit erratic when it comes to that sort of stage. So something in there just to settle them, which just really, really helps the patient and gives them that, that good quality of life at the end. And then we have a PCA, so patient controlled analgesia. It is what it says on the tin. Put the picture here again but this is a machine that the patient controls so it's set that they can't press it any more times than sort of every five minutes and it'll give so many mils of morphine or a drug whatever they're on per five minutes so they can press it and they can press it as much as they want but it'll only give the medication every five minutes just to prevent an overdose or anything like that so that's the pca type of thing and then you have things like the bolus, like I said. So this is just, a di I'm using the hand just for an example, just because it's easier. But this is literally just straight into the cannula over a set period of time, like a couple of minutes. And it's just a syringe that will just slowly go into, straight into the vein and into the body. And lastly, but not least, we have a pick line, which is more inserted if someone needs long-term therapy. So if they need it long-term rather than just a quick fix kind of thing, which is changed every so often. And that's just you to give again fluids medications anything that person needs how is this delivered so this is delivered through a cannula or you might have heard the word venflon i think it's pretty much the same thing but it's like a little needle with different ends to it that goes straight into the vein and they will attach something to it to put that fluid in so sometimes it's just a syringe um, sometimes you're attached to a drip or a syringe driver or a pca for example so there's all these different 
different ways that you can do these things and it just depends again on the person and what they're having and why they're having it it, it depends on what type of cannula that they might put in but nice have broken it down to four types of cannula that you can have so first up we have a ported cannula so this is a little needle and it'll have a port on it to do different things with and you can have the non-ported cannula and this will either have little wings at the side or non-winged so you can have either and i think these are more used for the iv drips because it's connected straight onto the iv drip or maybe if you're giving a um syringe it via syringe into the tubing and the cannula and the veins and all that jazz the integrated cannula so this cannula is something that it's like a little needle it's got the ports but it has different ports on it for different things so you might want to take blood from one port and you might want to give medication in another port they can't be used from the same port um, and this is just because it can get clogged up with medications and things like that and you don't want to be taking blood from something that's had medication in it if that makes sense because it might affect the results so yeah so that's why they have the different ports for different things and like i said the are different ways of doing IV so you might have a drip stand I'm going to talk about drip rates and things like that after um, or you might have a syringe so sometimes IVs are given over a couple of minutes which is normally called the bolus so if you hear the word bolus you know it's going to be sort of a quicker um, two minutes sort of jobby or five minutes sometimes so I've seen a mentor that's actually had to look at the clock and time how long she's doing the syringe for and she's been there for ages with it or you can have the drip stand and or syringe driver and it's given over a period of a few hours or 12 hours 24 hours whatever but they're just the, the timings there's all different times for different things it just depends again what the patient's having why they're having it and the route that they're, they're going to give it so what are the risks of having an IV? So the obvious ones are infection. Anything you're going to put into the body that's a foreign object, there's always that risk of infection, which is why it's aseptic technique. There's the risk of collapsing veins. There's also a risk of not being in the vein properly and the fluid that you're putting in can leak out into the tissues. I have seen this happen before where the, the patient, I think, has just moved or something and it's knocked and then it's come out a little bit. So then the whole arm has started swelling because the fluid is going into the arm. And um, that's not pleasant, I don't think, for somebody. And with anything, you can get some pain as well with it. And then lastly, you can give somebody too much fluid. And um, I, I, I'm assuming that this is more with if you're inserting something too quickly or if they've got some fluids going in and it's running too quickly, you can overload the body. So that's the last thing you want to do with anyone to make sure that your drip rates are right, getting the right amount of fluid for their body weight little things like that so if your patient is having um, some IV therapy fluids and um, they start complaining of shortness of breath and they can't breathe and maybe some pain maybe some ankle swelling leg swelling um, swelling on the hands things like that that's a good indicator that something's gone wrong and they might be overloaded with fluids so you want to stop that as soon as possible any signs or symptoms of anything realistically you want to stop as soon as possible and assess the situation before restarting it which leads me nicely onto drip rates. Now, oh, we've all had the drug calculations. If you haven't had your drug calculations yet, I did do a vlog actually about drug calculations. So have a look at that. But I'm putting some links below as well. The RCN have got a really good one, more specifically to drop rates and flow rates and all of that jazz. It's really, really good. Have a look. This is where I've got all of my information from. So yes, here we go. A flow rate is the volume in milliliters divided by the time in hours. And the drop rate is the drop factor times by the volume divided by 60 times by the time in hours. I know. But what is the drop factor? So the drop factor is how many drops per milliliters of fluid. So how many drops does it take to make up that milliliter of fluid? And normally it's either 20 or 15. If it's 20 drops, then that's normally like the clear fluids that you get. But if it's 15 drops, it's more of a thicker fluid, if that makes sense. Um, so things like blood, for example, might be 15 drops per minute. But when we did our IV training at uni, it, it told you on the bag um, that it gave you that details actually on the bag. So have a look at that. And if you're not sure, have ask your mentor, of course, or anyone that's around you. So the flow rate is quite simple. It's volume in milliliters divided by hours. And that's your flow rate. That's it. So let's go on to drop rates. And I'm going to give you an example. So if you have 100 milliliters infusion, if it's running at 42 per minutes and you're assuming that it's 20 drops per milliliters, 
what is the equation? I hope that makes sense. So you've got 100 millilitres, 42 minutes and 20 drops per millilitres. Pause it, work it out and see if you get it right. So your drop rate is 42 and your drop factor is 20 um, drops per millilitres. So you do 42 divided by 20, which will give you 2.1 millilitres per minute. And then because you've got your 2.1 millilitres per minute now, you can do the 100 divided by the 2.1 millilitres, which gives you 47.6 minutes. That's your answer. I hope that makes sense. But all the links are below. Please have a look because this example is on there. I've literally taken it from the RCN just to give you an example and try and explain it a little bit better. But it is it's simple when you see it. Honestly, guys, it's fine. And next, IV flushes. So you might have seen this happen as well out there. I've seen it a few times. So why do they do this? So basically they do this to prevent uh, medications and things like that clogging up in the tube. It's also to help um, deliver some medications as well into the vein. And also to help make sure that different medications don't mix together. So if someone's on a few medications through an IV line, if they're doing it bolus, then they might flush it just to make sure that it's all clear for the next medication so that they don't mix or interact or anything like that. So I think that's it for IV therapy. I feel like this has been a really quick winded vlog. I'm really sorry, guys. I can't think of anything else. Like I've done the, what is it? Uh, why do you use it? What situations you use it? Drip rates, flow rates, what types? All of that jazz. Um, I can't think of anything else, but if there's anything I've missed and you really, really want to know this burning question or answer, um, just put a comment below and I will try my best to answer it or find the answer for you. But have a Google. Guys, everything's on the internet now. You can find the NICE guidelines, you can find RCN, things like that, NMC, all that jazz. Everything is accessible online now. So please read guidelines and follow NICE procedures and all of that jazz before anything else. Again, links are below. Have a look. But for now, I'm going to say goodbye and I hope you all have an amazing week and I shall see you next time. Bye.